Um, so I'm going to talk on more consequences of evolutionary mismatch um, far beyond the standard things we think about diet and exercise. And so that evolutionary mismatch, as Aaron said in the introduction to the whole conference, that's kind of the central concept of what we all think about in, a, in this context. We're clearly now out of sync with how we evolved in the modern food environment. It's the most obvious thing. As an evolutionary biologist, I think a lot about animal examples, and musk ox are um, a great example. They have a defensive circling behavior where the adults form a circle with horns out around the young or weaker ones inside. And that works great against wolves. But in the modern world where humans have guns, that unfortunately is a tragic mismatch. Um, they were widespread across the Arctic, but in Alaska, for example, they were wiped out in the early 20th century. So another important concept, and again, Aaron in his talk brought this up, is the concept of, the, of supernormal stimuli. And so that's any stimulus that elicits a response greater than normal. And Nico Tinbergen coined the term. Many authors have written about it. Deidre Barrett actually wrote a book in 2010. And one of the classic examples is the oyster catcher. Um, it will try to incubate a ridiculously large fake egg that it couldn't possibly have laid while ignoring its own. And obviously, we've all heard about humans and high sugar, high artificially brightly colored junk foods. And there are lots of other examples that most of us are familiar with um, of mismatch, lack of exercise, lack of sleep, lack of sun exposure, etc. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to focus on two categories of things. One category, mistreatment of women, child abuse, unequal distribution of resources and greed. And I think they're driven in some ways by the same, one of the same processes. And then difficulty with long-term planning. So let's look at this first. And I'm going to focus in initially on extreme unequal distribution of resources and greed. So let's look at several slides. This is from 2014. 85 richest people in the world have as much wealth as the poorest, 3.5 billion. Okay. Two years later, earlier this year, the 62 richest people have as much wealth as half the world. It's gotten worse. In the U.S., the wealthiest 160,000 families own as much wealth as the poorest 145 million families. Now, if we think about this, in the modern world, it's one thing, but let's think about the ancestral context, the African savanna, but not just the physical context. Let's think about the ancestral social environment. Hunter-gatherer band size varied, but if you look at the literature on hunter-gatherers, a band of something like 30 is not unreasonable. And then let's tie in what is called signaling theory. This is, a lot of work has been done in this by evolutionary psychologists and, and others. And this examines signals between individuals, both the physical signals that individuals project, but also their behavioral signals. And people like Jeffrey Miller, who's, speaking at, who's spoken at this conference, obviously thinks a lot about signaling theory. But this is particularly important for sexual selection, but it's also critical for survival in a small group hunter-gatherer type situation. So let's think then about what would be the signal sent by an individual that in a, in a group of hunter-gatherers where you interact with those people throughout your whole life, what would be the signal sent by an individual that mistreated women, that abused children, or that hoarded resources and wouldn't share? I think it's pretty clear what the signals would be, right? What would happen to the mating opportunities of an individual like that? What would their reputation or group status would be like? Um, what kind of reciprocity would happen when they were not able to have food if they had hoarded all, at all other times? And even to the point of group inclusion and shunning, which would have big impacts on survival. So, Human behavior evolved to be both altruistic and greedy, or to be both cooperative and competitive. But in a hunter-gatherer society, there were significant social constraints. And there were severe consequences to an individual in a small group 
for antisocial behaviors. Such an individual would almost certainly have been ostracized or even ejected. But now let's go to the modern world. The anonymity of the modern world, the huge population size, the economic systems in place, this insulates individuals from the effects of their greed or other bad behavior. And so unconstrained greed is now actually glorified. Houses with tin baths, conspicuous consumption, purposeful waste. To me, this is a clear example of a mismatch in the modern world. Let's look at long-term planning. And I think that's another mismatch. Um, retirement planning and failure to address climate change. So as hunter-gatherers, how did we evolve? How is our brain wired? Do we have cognitive biases? And I think Aaron would probably say, yep, we've got some cognitive biases. Um, many biases are built in. One that I spend a lot of time doing field work, and anybody who's spent any time in the field, how many times have you jumped when you mistook a stick for a snake? It happens all the time. Um, and I like snakes, but you still jump if you step and think you've stepped on one. We rarely make the reverse mistake. This is built into primate brains. We know this from studies of other primates. So what are the implications of these and other biases for dealing with long-term problems? So let's take retirement and investing. And this is, to me, kind of a, a striking example. Let's say that we invest a small amount of money, $5 a day, just $5 a day. And you invest that in the stock market beginning at age 24. How much do you have when you're my age? 64, okay? Now this is um, pretty clear cut. We're gonna use in this calculation a 9% interest rate. And that, by the way, is below the long-term average of the U.S. stock market. The U.S. stock market over either a 100-year period or a 25-year period, almost any longer-term period, has yielded roughly 10%. These are easily accessible data, okay? So what might you guess? $5 a day. Well, that's the cost of a pack of cigarettes, by the way. If you do that, you come up with $717,000. My wife sitting here in front, is a PhD mathematician. I had her actually derive this formula from scratch. I didn't trust Excel. She derived it. I also used the future, future value function on Excel. We got exactly the same, down to the penny, the same value. Um, $5 a day. Now, why am I bothering to talk about this? Well, if you think about it, how many of us waste $5 a day? How many people in the US? Even people who are destitutely poor. It's really easy from the rational standpoint to amass some wealth. But 30% of US households at or near retirement age have less than $10 in assets. Sorry, 10,000 in assets. Another 24% have only between 10,000 and 100,000 to live on for the rest of their lives. So in other words, more than half of all US retired households have to live almost entirely on Social Security. That's not a pleasant prospect, and that is not an application of long-term thinking. Why? What's going on? Well, there are so many cognitive biases involved, this evolutionary heritage. This often prevents people from making rational decisions for long-term planning. And there's evidence from human and primate studies, functional MRI work. This is um, fairly widely known now, these unconscious biases or innate rules of thumb evolve because they work. They actually work in a natural context. So there are many of these biases, um, and there's a lot of work been done on this from a variety of fields, evolutionary psycholo psychology, neuroeconomics, particularly behavioral ecology. Um, books have been written on this. People have thought about this. But to me, this is clearly an evolutionary mismatch, and I want to examine three. We could pick many of these cognitive biases, but I just want to look at three of them. Discounting the future and a present bias. This makes us more likely 
to value immediate rewards over future rewards. And in other words, spend now, save later. But let's think about hunter-gatherers facing food choices or water choices. Do they eat the food now or do they save it for the future? Well, there was no saving it. They would eat things now, feast now. We have a built-in bias against delayed gratification. So the end result is we spend too much now, not save enough. There's another of these biases called loss aversion. Studies have shown we feel loss more than we feel gains. And some people have called this the life dinner principle. Better to err on the side of caution when foraging if you're foraging around predators, because it's better to miss a meal than to lose your life. It's an error management strategy that's evolved. And so the end result of this is we're too conservative in our investments and in our asset allocation, and we tend, humans tend to panic in down stock markets. And the result is tragic. Signaling theory is one more. We send all kinds of social signals. And social status is often through doing what others in a group do. In our society, this, these, some of these social signals have gotten hijacked, and now we use conspicuous consumption to signal success. Jeffrey Miller's actually written a whole book on this type of thing. We now have supernormal social stimuli, and the result is that um, we're susceptible to advertising, which uses supernormal stimuli, and we spend too much. So in other words, over the course of a lifetime, many people save too little, spend too much, and if they do save, they invest it in inappropriate ways. Now there's another long-term planning problem, climate change. But first I want to throw in a concept that extends evolutionary mismatch just a little bit, and that's the idea of an evolutionary trap. So an evolutionary trap is when an evolved and previously adapted trait becomes so mismatched due to rapid environmental change that it leads to a major decline in or possibly the extinction of a species. And I want to give three animal examples because I like animals and I think these are all pretty telling. So let's think about an albatross. Albatrosses are pretty spectacular birds. They have the longest wingspan of any living, living bird. The wandering has a wingspan of almost 12 feet. That's a big wingspan. Unfortunately for the albatross, they will eat brightly colored pieces of plastic floating in the ocean. That acts as a supernormal stimulus to the albatrosses. And that response evolved to get them food. Anything floating is liable to be an appropriate food source. But now their guts fill with trash, and that can be fatal. And I have a friend who's a marine ornithologist, and it's now thought that this is causing serious population declines in some of the species. The jewel beetle is another fantastic example. This is a beetle that lives in Western Australia, and this was some research done in the 1980s, and they suffer from a supernormal stimulus. It just happened there was a beer company making bottles, and the bottles resemble the females. The females are large, larger than the males. They have these orangish wing covers that have dimples in it. Well, these beer bottles were gigantic, they were really shiny and orange, and they had dimples. Well, the poor females languished. They didn't get to mate. The males just wouldn't mate with them. The males were too busy mating with the beer bottles, and they would literally mate with the beer bottles until they died of dehydration, or maybe even worse, ants would kill them in some cases by eating off their genitals as they were copulating. Fortunately, this evolutionary trap was avoided for that species because it was worried about serious decline because the beer bottle changed, was, the design was changed and so it ended, um, ended well. Ruby-throated hummingbirds, my last animal example. These are very common in my yard. I have wildflowers. I purposely plant those with red flowers to attract the hummingbirds. They're one of the prettiest species, I think, in, in the ecosystem in the central U.S. So, in the 80s in the Midwest, 
These birds were attracted to red insulators on fence posts, on electric fences. So um, you have current running through these electric fences. The hummingbirds were attracted to these bright red um, insulators. They looked tubular. It was a supernormal stimulus. They would probe into those insulators to get nectar. They would ground themselves and be electrocuted and die. And so there were lots of deaths. But again, fortunately, the company changed the insulators. And I'm involved in a prairie restoration, and we have some electric fencing. You can't buy red insulators. You can get black insulators and yellow insulators and white insulators. Fortunately, no red. So again, this trap was, was avoided by a human change. Now, I'm going to talk about two evolutionary traps. Both involve long-term thinking and both big picture thinking, which I'll argue we didn't evolve for. And I'm going to talk just one more minute on the extreme inequality in resources, but I'm going to focus on climate change. So this unequal distribution of resources, we have an innate drive to signal things like health and sexual vigor and success effectiveness. But in the modern world, this has gotten hijacked. And the result is that many people want more and more and more because we're getting these supernormal social stimuli. And in a group setting, people try to signal in a supernormal way. And so it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in some ways. So we get an incredible amount of excess and waste. And the end result, instability in economies, wide-scale destruction of natural habitats, extinction and incredible pollution. If you live in Beijing, it doesn't matter how wealthy you are. If you haven't been to Beijing and seen the pollution and felt the pollution, it's absolutely shocking. It's a trap. Climate change. I would say it's an evolutionary trap for us. And this may appear out of context, but I think you'll see I'll tie this in to evolutionary mismatch. So I'm really lucky, I'm fortunate, I've been able to travel a lot because one of my interests is evolution in extreme environments, and I've been all over the world and seen glaciers um, widely. This is a photo I took about a month ago in Alaska. Alaska is quite an interesting place in terms of the change in glaciers. More than 99% of the glaciers in Alaska are retreating. And this is happening, though, all over the world. There's glacial recession, I've seen it in in Antarctica, I've seen it in South America, you can see it all over the planet. Glaciers are retreating everywhere. Mount Kilimanjaro, I took this photo in 1992. If you compare this to the glaciers now, the glaciers are almost gone. In the Arctic, so in the past two years, I've been fortunate to be in three places in the extreme far northern Arctic, including northern Greenland, and the Arctic is where some of the most rapid warming is occurring anywhere on the planet. And you can now take small ships in places where just a few years ago it was utterly impossible. Um, it's still not hot, but you can take, you can get to these places now. And um, less than a year ago, I was standing on the Greenland ice, ice cap, and it is dramatically thinning, dramatically. And that's the second largest ice cap in the world. So let's think about this Greenland ice cap and see what the data say. So Greenland ice mass has been going down in a shocking manner. This is NOAA data. Um, so we know this is happening. This is not debated. You know, I mean, this is, you can measure using various types of mechanisms. Here's a headline from earlier this year, 2000, January of this year, 2015 was the hottest year in recorded history. By the way, 2014 was the second hottest year in recorded history. And a headline from about a month ago, less than a month ago, at this point, 2016 is on its way to be even hotter. Now, whether the year turns out to be like that, I don't know. But it's, at this point, it's on its way to being even hotter. So this is interesting to me. Why do? the vast majority of unbiased scientists with nothing to gain or lose, what do they think? Well, 
Nobody's sure, you know, scientists were never 100% sure of anything, but most think it's a serious long-term threat. I have friends who are biogeochemists, who are atmospheric physicists, in a variety of fields, people who have actually studied it, not just read about it, but people who have actually studied it, and they're very, very concerned. So, despite the evidence, we basically have global inaction. There's a lot of talk, but we basically have global inaction. Is this an evolutionary trap for us? Is this the problem that our cognitive systems may not be capable of dealing with? And I think that's worth exploring. So, it might be a perfect trap for us, for our species. Climate change has been discussed as a particularly different problem for humans by a number of authors, and it's easy to find things. But I would argue that it's almost a perfect evolutionary trap because it sends the wrong alarm systems to our brains. We may not be wired to deal with it because, uh, again, all of these cognitive biases. So let's think about some of these cognitive biases. Our brains evolved to respond to certain things. Our brains evolved to respond to immediate threats. A predator going after us or our small in-group, our small band. We evolved to be very good at predator avoidance. That's not what climate change is like. It's a long-term problem. We evolved to respond to things that appear suddenly or grow rapidly versus slow-moving, gradual change. We don't often perceive things that are happening slowly over years. In other words, it gives the wrong alarm signal. Our brains evolve to respond to things that don't require short-term sacrifice versus long-term gain. This is called loss diversion. We're much more sensitive to loss. So if we have to sacrifice something now for a long-term goal, this is the same problem with saving. You have to sacrifice something now to save for later. It's the same cognitive bias playing out in a different context. There are many of these. I'm going to mention two others, but gosh, you, there's a whole litany of this type of thing. Social signals. We've talked about our brains evolved to respond to social stimuli. This is signaling theory that I've mentioned. We have a very high investment in forming beliefs consistent with our group identity. And this has implications for things becoming, like climate change, a political litmus test. It's interesting, many people on both sides of the political spectrum no longer think about this stuff. That's their line because their in-group, their tribe believes a certain way. They don't really look at any of the data, they just assume because it's what their tribe says. And finally, our brains evolve to respond to danger from other humans. If you think about hunter-gatherers, the most dangerous thing we would encounter in the wild as a small band would be another group of humans. We could easily defend ourselves. Any of us, you pick 30 of us, give us some sticks, we can defend ourselves from lions but we can defend ourselves from another group of stronger, faster, potentially, uh, other humans. So it's not surprising that we have some xenophobic tendencies, fear of outsiders, and if you think about climate change, that's something that requires us to cooperate broadly with people all over the world, with other countries, with other political parties, and there is some prejudice against outgroups, and we're very sensitive to potential cheaters. So an outgroup that's cheating, it just sets off all our alarms. Again, the wrong kind of signals. So there are many cognitive biases. These are a few. There are many others. But I'm interested in thinking about a few strategies. How can we apply some strategies that respect our evolutionary heritage how can we apply a few strategies, strategies that help address climate change and help address other long-term planning problems? These are just two long-term planning problems. There are many others that we have to deal with. So, and we think about what, is, what are our goals? You know, what ultimately, um, what are our goals in life? Well, I, for one, 
want to enjoy the benefits of the modern world in all their wonderful manifestation. I want to enjoy them, but I don't want to completely ignore problems around me. And I think many of us are like that. So how can we apply strategies that allow some of this but that respect our evolution, including our cognitive biases. If we're going to solve some of these problems, we've got to think about this. And so I'm going to mention five strategies. There are many others. But these are some that can be applied in both, say, a financial arena or in a bigger context, like dealing with um, huge long-term problems like climate change. One is simply to increase awareness and recognition, to understand our tendencies. Evolutionary psychology has done a, done a wonderful job of, of allowing us to see some of our potential weaknesses, our biases, and how we can, if we know about these, we might be able to do something about them. Another is to have strategies that counter time discounting and a bias about everything in the present. So strategies that help us connect with our future selves or with our descendants. If you're thinking about retirement, do you want to live in your kid's basement? Um, think about when you retire, what do you want to do? Counter status quo bias. In other words, we have all a tendency to um, suffer from inertia, aversion to change. Scientists have to ch train themselves, by the way, to be able to change when there's new data. That's what I tell my students from the first day I have them in class. You've got to be able to change your mind if you want to be a scientist. We find things all the time. I see Aaron smiling. We find things, you go into an experiment, and it's, you don't get the results you expected. You'd better change your mind. If you can't, you get in trouble. So we can apply strategies that help us make positive changes we can, that can be applied in many ways, saving money or saving energy. Another strategy, focus on effects close in time and space. To do things, people need personal salience. It's very difficult to think of big picture things that don't apply to people individually. So to emphasize how things can have an impact on you or your loved ones. Um, if somebody is doing retirement things, to be able to track a retirement account and to track it over time and to see positive change. Or to emphasize changes in local weather patterns that may be the result of climate change. And finally, set up systems to ensure our success versus having to use willpower. Willpower um, is not something we want to have to apply all the time. I think many of us know about this with um, having junk food in the house. If you don't want to eat it, what do you do? You just don't bring it there because you're not likely to go out at night and forage for it. But if it's in there, it's not a pretty picture often, right? So with retirement, set up automatic withdrawals. That's kind of one of the most basic things. Any, any retirement planner will tell you, put things on automatic, set and forget. Do things like this in other contexts like climate change. And this counters decision fatigue. So we can do, apply some of these strategies that respect our biases, and maybe we can use them to help us in a variety of long-term planning situations. So I'd like to thank AHS, um, Aaron, and all of his many colleagues who provide these wonderful uh, opportunities for us all to share, and thanks to you for your attention, and I think I'm ready for questions. Uh, excellent talk right down my alley. Um, Thanks. Yeah, so there are many advantages of living in a market economy, you know. Absolutely. Uh, uh, but it, it's like the, uh, the uh, beetle with the co copulating with the bottle, those bottles don't then become even more attractive and even more attractive, and the problem doesn't get worse and worse. It's bad enough like it is, but in market economies, that's one of the disadvantages is that uh, once, we, once these products, you know, hyperpalatable foods or whatever, um, you know, start to appeal to us, they, they get market forces would then make them more available, you know, and then that drives even more. So it's just like a, like a, a sort of a runaway effect. Right. And uh, yeah, 
I think we're very fortunate to live in market economies. They're fantastic. Um, you know, there's no other system that's proven to work nearly as well. But how do we help shape market economies so that they don't drive us down a dark path? That's yeah. Yeah, do you, do you see any trends uh, that are currently, uh, I mean, this, this organization and the, the paleo movement, I think, ancestral movement, uh, is, is one uh, force that's driving in, in, in other directions, too, which is good. But do you see any other areas where the market is fa facilitating us getting out of these evolutionary traps? Well, I think if you actually do look at the financial planning area, there's a lot of application to these principles that really are helping people in many ways. So um, I think we're tr the financial market at least in the better corners of that um, area, are doing things that really help people in this regard, so helping us get out of those traps. So it's, it's a good point. Aaron? Well, <clears throat> first I want to thank you for providing lots, doing the heavy lifting and, and making slides that I can now scavenge for some of my classes. You bet. <laughs> so I cover <laughs> the topic of mismatch and supernormal stimuli in my courses. Uh, but what I also wanted to ask is, it's really hard to um, have individuals recognize that they're, how their actions affect a global society. Absolutely. This is what the, the leaders are supposed to be doing, right? As well, we think we're electing leaders, we have systems in place, but those systems are maladapted, they're mismatched, and that would right. be fitting with what you're talking about. Is there a way, do you think, that biologists who understand these concepts could somehow educate the system leaders in a way that they, the ones who actually do want to do good actually, uh, not the ones who are in it for their own benefit, to somehow change the way that the system is structured from the top down through you, that knowledge to then make it easier for the societies to work together and, and solve the individual dilemmas that we face? That's a, a great question. It's the same one we face with how do we get thought leaders in conventional, say in conventional medicine, conventional public health, how do we get thought leaders to modify their views so that the message spreads s from the top as well as from the bottom? And I think that's a very difficult question. I mean, um, in the context of health, that's why I have started a public health program at an undergraduate institution, so we can start infusing those. But um, Unless we can get some thought leaders who model behavior and where there's a social um, signal that that's positive, we have to do that in a way that makes sense. And it's, it's not easy. Um, there are some thought leaders that are trying to do that, but it's, it's tough. So thank you for the question. I wish I had a magic answer. <laughs> Hello. Uh, great presentation. Thank so you. we have this mismatches in uh, how they can be deleterious to our advancement. Do you know of any examples where we can use these mismatches to maybe advance this ancestral health movement? Like for example, we're talking, I was talking to, with Dr. Gersmart about how BPAs was replaced from bottles, not because they were bad for us, but because the market spoke and said, we don't want BPAs. And I remember a time where we were looking at the bottles, you know, oh, I don't want that bottle because it has BPAs. So it was replaced with a different compound. It turns out these other compounds are not as, you know, as safe as we thought they were. So right. can we take advantage of these mismatches? Do you know of any examples of uh, where we can do this and advance this movement? So I think your point is a good one. Market forces are very powerful. And this is where awareness can have a big impact. You know, for years, things like, um, gosh, many of y'all weren't born then, but when the tuna industry underwent a revolution because of market forces to have tuna caught in a way, or have the fishing done in a way that didn't drown marine mammals. And so market forces were able to shape that behavior. If we can somehow um, get market forces working in other areas, and we see that beginning to happen in the financial markets, that market forces are shifting people now towards financial advisors that are applying some of these techniques rather than parasitizing the people who they are uh, supposedly advising. So uh, that's a great, it's a wonderful point and one I'm going to have to think about in a lot more detail. So I'm going to give you some additional food for thought. That's Fantastic. Like Adele. a dietetics joke. Um, so following up on Aaron's question and, and that, that comment, 
I actually have suggestions for how, <laughs> how to do this. And there are things that you did in your presentation this morning that, um, so I'm in a communications program. We, we read some of these same, we have, we have some overlap here. And it's all about telling the story. So the story that you told about the beetles and the bottles, the story that you told about the hummingbirds and those, the, getting those stories and showing how those are our stories as well, that's critical. And we're not particularly good at seeing how people relate to the stories when we've got our brains on the science, but it, you're, you're telling a story, and, it, and those are great stories, and they're very compelling, and it makes it easy to make that transition. So I just wanted to commend you for that and that great talk, and to say that you've got that tool right there in your back pocket just to expand upon it. Thank you. You know, um, if you think about, again, this respects our evolutionary history. If you think about how we evolved, humans communicated person to person in small group settings by telling stories, the oral tradition, for literally hundreds of thousands, probably a million, two million years, depending on when you think talking evolved. Um, and it's not surprising we're very receptive. You, you can get a message across in the form of a story rather than simply data. Um, it can have a much more salient effect to the listener. And so I, I love how, how can we do that more? And that's a fantastic point. Hi there. I, I, I'm in basic agreement with a lot of the things that you're saying in this talk. I, I have in fact, worked on a, a, the interaction between market and mis, mis, market. Uh, and mismatch for about 20 years. Fantastic. So I think it's, it's a really important thing to understand. And I, per, I believe in global warming is a real problem. But I don't have children. And as an economic actor, I want to point out that, that after I die, I don't care what happens to the world. So let right. me, the reason I'm saying this is because it's, it's actually a moral position to say that, that we should do something about global warming and, and, and a lot of these long-term problems. I think my life is a lot better because other people did the same kind of calculus and said, let's do something really good for the future, right. even though we won't enjoy it. But it is a moral position as opposed to like, like a mistake in, in rational decision making. Right. It, and you know, from the evolutionary biology standpoint, um, there's a lot of research on group selection. And so groups that behave in rational ways, even if it might not benefit the individual, if it benefits the group, we have a tendency. So how can we um, springboard off of that? But you're right, as an individual economic actor, you know, um, you want to drink champagne while the Titanic is going down. Um, but hopefully we can, we can apply our thinking morally and to a larger group context. So that's a, another wonderful point. Hi, I, I think it's great that you were talking about global warming and just wanted to point out that Al Gore made such an impact with his personal crusade, An Inconvenient Truth. And I would say that w I, I would like to challenge the leaders in the room here of the ancestral health movement to think about the other inconvenient truth that we're telling people to eat the wrong things. Um, and we have uh, Jeb Bush, who's paleo, and not that busy right now. Um, <laughs> Could the ancestral health movement approach him and ask him to make this his personal crusade as he's sort of post-presidential? And um, it sounds like a crazy idea, but I, sometimes I think in terms of outreach, that sort of guerrilla action is what's really going to make a change. So. That's above my pay grade. Um, <laughs> but, you know, everything gets complicated when you start with the tri you get into politics and you get into the tribal. Uh, tribal mentality. So I don't know. It's a very interesting point. And there are groups that are trying, um, that across the political spectrum, that are trying to work on this type of problem. Um, I heard an interview the other day by um, a Republican congressman who is no longer in Congress, but this is his passion now. So, yes, climate change in general. I think one final question. I just, I just am looking for you to give me a little bit of hope because here's what I think. You know, I go to the grocery store and we can't even get people to bring reusable bags. Like, and this is such an, 
none of these problems are insurmountable, but they take people actually caring and being aware. And I see people get two or three little items and they double bag it and they tie it. And you know they're not gonna reuse those bags because when they get home, they're gonna rip them. And like, we can't even do that much. How are we gonna do this? Give, so, give me some hope. <laughs> okay, so I'll tell you what um, my colleagues in environmental studies and I tell our students. Um, if you think back when, you know, I'm 64. When I was young, I was raised in Virginia where there was horrifying overt racism with not black and white baths, colored and white baths, okay, and different water fountains. At that time, if you think back, rivers caught on fire in the U.S. because of the extreme pollution. In the matter of, you know, a relatively few decades, I'm not saying our racist problems are over, but I can tell you they're better than they were when I was a boy, and the environmental problems of pollution in this country are much better than they were. Humans, our species evolved, we think. Our big brains are partly as a result of we're a species that's able to deal with change. And if the right change can happen, if conditions are right, I think we can switch and make progress pretty rapidly. So that, to me, is the hope. We have made changes in other contexts pretty quickly, and I think it's possible in, in these longer-term things as well. So to me, that's a, that's a, I'm very glad that you brought that up because I don't want to, you know, be a bucket of cold water. So thank, thank you. Thank you.